let's open our Bibles to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. We're walking through the Gospel of John. Okay. I think I'm on this time, Kevin. I think I turned it on. John 9 and John 10 actually are one narrative that just flows. Sometimes the chapters and the verses, um, sometimes we, they help us. You know, sometimes they help, and sometimes they don't help one way or another. And sometimes they actually may hinder because you're right in the middle of a thought. John 9 and John 10 are actually one conversation that is going on. So I want to start reading in John chapter 9, verse 35, and I want to read to John chapter 10, verse 21. Um, if you remember from last week, the Pharisees, the Jewish leaders, had kicked this young man out of the synagogue, out of the church, they excommunicated him because Jesus healed him, which is crazy because he'd been blind his whole life and they were okay with that. But now that he's healed and he can see, they're not okay with that. So they excommunicated him. If you were here last week, you heard that. And if not, you can listen to it online. But they excommunicated this young man, said you can't come back to synagogue anymore. because it, and, and, and he had nothing to do with it. Jesus healed him. And he's just healed. He can see now. And they asked, well, who, who did this? He said, I don't know. What I know is I once was blind and now I can see. Amen? Isn't that all of our stories? I once was blind, now I can see. So through all that, they excommunicated this young man from their synagogue. Jesus found out about it, and then he goes to comfort the young man, and then he turns on these Pharisees, and what you have then is this uh, sermon, basically from Jesus, about the door and the good shepherd. So let's start reading in John chapter 9, verse 35. Jesus heard that they had thrown the man out. And when he found him, he asked, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? He asked. Jesus answered, You have seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. I believe, Lord, he said. And he worshiped him. Jesus said, I came to this world for judgment in order that those who do not see will see and those who do see will become blind. Some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these things and asked him, we aren't blind too, are we? If you were blind, Jesus told them, you wouldn't have sinned. You wouldn't have sin. But now that you say we see your sin remains, truly I tell you, see it just goes straight into it. Truly I tell you, anyone who doesn't enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in some other way as a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens it for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought all his own household out, when he's brought all his own outside, he goes ahead of them. The sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will never follow a stranger. Instead, they will run away from him because they don't know the voice of strangers. Jesus gave them this figure of speech, but they did not understand what he was telling them. Jesus said again, truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers. There it is again, thieves and robbers. Verse 1, thieves and robbers. Verse 8, thieves and robbers. But the sheep didn't listen to them. I am the gate. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. A thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I've come so that they may have life and have it in abundance. I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, since he is not the shepherd and doesn't own the sheep, leaves them and runs away when he sees a wolf coming. The wolf then snatches and scatters them. This happens because he is a hired hand and doesn't care about the sheep. I'm the good shepherd. I know my own. And my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. But I have other sheep that are not from this sheep pen. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. Then there will be one flock, one shepherd. This is why the Father loves me because I lay down my life so that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own. 
I have the right to lay it down, and I have the right to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. Again, the Jews were divided because of these words. Many of them were saying, he has a demon, and he's crazy. Why do you listen to him? Others were saying, these aren't the words of someone who is demon-possessed. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? If you jump down to verse 25 and following, I want to read this as well. I did tell you and you don't believe, Jesus answered them. The works that I do in my Father's name testify about me, but you don't believe me because you're not of my sheep. Here it is. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. You know, I was thinking earlier this morning, this has nothing to do with the sermon, but I hold in my hand, and you hold in your hand, in your lap, a book that has more power in it than all the nuclear power plants on the planet. This is the Word of God. And thanks be to God for giving it to us. If you've lived very long, you've seen your share of leaders. I've seen, I've seen some great leaders in uh, churches. I've sat under some great pastors, amazing guys. I've sat under some good pastors, and I've sat under some not so good. I think we, we can all identify great presidents we've had, and presidents that were good they weren't great but they weren't bad and then we can all point our finger in history to some presidents that were bad the same could be said for businesses you know this leader was really good and he helped the company go forward or she helped the company go forward these people were okay they were more game managers than anything else these people actually set us back here's what i know that in the absence of great leadership we will follow good leadership and unfortunately, in the, in the absence of good leadership, we will follow bad leadership. And I'm going to step out of the preaching realm for just a second and jump over into the political realm. Did you see that? It's preaching, here's political. I'm afraid that if things don't change in our country before the next presidential election, we will be forced to choose between a bad leader and a bad leader, which is no choice. Right Now what Jesus was saying to them, and I want you to get the big picture. I want to tell you what I'm going to tell you, then I'm going to tell you, then I'll tell you what I told you. Okay? So what you're seeing here is Jesus saying to these Pharisees, you guys are terrible leaders. You're terrible shepherds. You excommunicated this young man for what? Because he can see now. That wasn't on him, that was on me. You should, and, and all this is behind the scenes, but he, he's like he's communicating to these, these guys. Why don't you sit down with him and have an honest conversation instead of a judgmental conversation and say, well, we'll see, you next, we'll see you next Sabbath. We'll try to make some sense of this. But no, you kicked him out of the, you told him he couldn't come worship here anymore because he didn't fit your paradigm. He didn't fit your thinking. You didn't like his healing because I did it. You guys are terrible leaders. You're terrible shepherds. You don't even know what it means to be a shepherd. You're thieves and robbers. Now, in this passage, we have two of the seven I am's in the Gospel of John. The first one is John 6, 35, I'm the bread of life. The second one is in John 8, 12, I'm the light of the world. The third one and fourth one is in this chapter. The fifth one is John 11, 30, 11, 25, I'm the resurrection and the life. The sixth one is John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. The seventh one is John 15, 1, I am the vine. Usually Jesus spreads these things out, but in this particular case, he puts two of them together, which is interesting. But let me show you why he puts two of these together. This is a sheep fold. That's what they look like. I, that's just a sheep fold. 
and it's about five, six feet high, and the walls themselves, the walls are smooth rocks on the inside and out. But you can see on the, on the top, they're sharp, jagged rocks, and they would also put in there sharp stones to keep the predators out and to keep the sheep in. Now watch this. Right here is called the door or the gate. And Jesus said, I am the door. What a good shepherd would do is they, he would lay down, he would get all the sheep into the, the pen, and then he would lay down across this place right here, and he became the gate, he became the door, and he would sleep there. The sheep couldn't get out, and the predators couldn't get in without going over him. And he laid down his life for the sheep. Isaiah 53 is a great passage about, the, about Christ coming. It's, it's, this is about his crucifixion, and you know that. I mean, if you're a Bible student, you know that Isaiah 53 is about the crucifixion of Christ. But in Isaiah 53, verse 6, it says, We all went astray like sheep. We all have turned to our own way, and the Lord has punished him, and I put in parentheses Jesus, for the iniquity of us all. I know you don't want to hear this, and I don't want to say this. But the Bible compares us to sheep. Sheep are really stupid. Therefore, we can be, I can be, really, thank you. I don't take that as a criticism. I know it's true. We need shepherding. We cannot function on our own, folks. We, I don't care how many degrees you have, how smart you are, how much money you've accumulated. You cannot make it on your own. Jesus said in John 15, 5, without me you can do nothing. Nothing. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have to have the shepherd to protect us and provide for us. Here's a couple of verses I found in Proverbs. When the righteous triumph, there is great rejoicing, but when the wicked come to power, people hide. Isn't that true? Here's, here's the same verse from the paraphrase message. When good people are promoted, everything is great, but when the bad are in charge, watch out. That's kind of the way it is. When you have bad leadership in a government, Bad leadership in a business, bad leadership in a church, bad leadership on a sports team, bad leadership anywhere. Poor leadership is bad. And when those things happen, watch out. Here's another one, Proverbs 29, verse 2. When the righteous flourish, the people rejoice. But when the wicked rule, people groan. Have you found yourself over the last 20 years Doing a lot of groaning. Like, Lord, I don't know what you're doing in our nation. I know we, have, we are not. I'm, and I'm going to say this. I said this earlier to some folks. We are a post-Christian nation. We are not a Christian nation. There are Christians in this nation. And our only hope is for the Christians to get right with God. And then the unsaved folks can get saved. And maybe then we have a chance. The Bible says in Psalms, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The Bible also says in Psalms, the wicked shall be turned into the grave in all nations that forget God. And if we think that we have a, a, a leg up on any other nation in history, we're fools. If we turn away from God and then we put wicked people in positions of leadership, watch out. We're going to groan. What had happened in Israel is for thousands of years, not hundreds of years, not dozens of years, but for thousands of years they had a good king and then some bad kings and then maybe a great king and then maybe a really bad king. And it, was all, it was back and forth and back and forth and back and forth for hundreds and hundreds of years. And at that point, subnormal had been, they'd been subnormal so long that normal seemed abnormal. 
Like, let me, let me see if I can explain. Um, I grew up in a kind of a dysfunctional home. It was, all, it was my father. It wasn't my mother. It was my father. We looked really good at church. Like, we had it, we had it going on. Man, the bakers were all about that. You just didn't live with us. Now, I happened to fall in love with a girl in the youth group whose family is leave it to Beaver Mayberry. Like sickening, nauseatingly good. And when we first got married, for the first five years of our marriage, I said to Tracy, y'all are just weird. Y'all are just weird. You know what I found out after about five years? They were normal. I was weird. Does that make sense? But I'd been living in a life of, of subnormality all my life. And when I saw the light of day, and I saw how normal people live, it took me about five or six years to go, oh, okay. That's the way you're supposed to do this. That's the way families actually function. They actually do love each other. <laughs> how weird is that? They're kind to each other. They're, they trust each other. They're... That's what was going on with Israel. For hundreds of years, they had bad leadership. And then Jesus comes along and he offers whew, peace, joy, serenity. Have you ever seen a, have you ever seen a, a, a dog, for example, that has been abused and they, sh they tremble? You know, you just want to pick that little dog up and hug it and say, it's okay. But they're, they're, they've just been beaten or starved or whatever. And it's going to take that little dog or cat or animal a while to start to get out of that. Same is true for people. Some of you have been abused in one way or another in your life, and you know it. You just don't snap your fingers and you're over it. You, it's going to take a while before the subnormal you get out of the basement of your life and you get up to where the sun is shining and where normal people live. And it still takes a while to get over that stuff. The nation of Israel had been going over hundreds of years of this stuff until Jesus came, came along and he offered them something they had never had before, this breath of fresh air. He was a good shepherd. What he was saying to them, the Pharisees, was, you're bad shepherds. You don't even know what the word shepherd means. You're lousy leaders. You kick a guy out of a church, out of a synagogue, because he's healed? You should be dancing in the streets celebrating with this guy. Hey, God, Elohim, Yahweh did a miracle on you. You can see. You've never been able to see. Now you can see. But instead, what do you do? You kick him out. And if anybody should be kicked out, it should be you guys, not him. Now, here's the way I've, I'm, I kind of wanted to outline this morning. If you look at, we're going to look at the first six verses, and then we're going to look at verse 7 through 10, and then 11 through 18. But what you find is Jesus knows his sheep. He knows them. Then you find that Jesus protects and provides for his sheep. Then you find that Jesus sacrifices for his sheep. Now, in seeing those three points, Jesus knows his sheep, it implies those Pharisees did not know their sheep. He's a shepherd. They're not shepherds. They're hirelings. They're thieves. They're robbers. They don't care. Jesus protects and provides for his sheep. They did not protect or provide for their flocks. The people that they were supposed to be leading and protecting and guiding, they were abusing. Jesus laid down his life, sacrificed his life for them. These Pharisees were not willing to do that. Now I want to walk through this with you. So let's look at verse 1 through 6. Jesus knows his sheep. Let me read this to you again. Truly I tell anyone, verse, verse 1, who doesn't enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in some other way is a thief and a robber. You see thief and a robber, verse 1. You see thief and a robber, verse 8. You see, verse 10, the thief comes but not but to kill, to steal, destroy. Jesus was saying to those leaders, you're... You're not a shepherd. You're a thief and a robber. You want to steal from these people. You want to kill them emotionally or physically. You want to destroy them. You don't care anything about them. Now, if you think this was a new problem with Jesus, it wasn't. I want to read to you. Now, don't turn there. Just take a screenshot or jot these down. I want to read to you from Isaiah, from Jeremiah, and from Hebrews. 
This is from Isaiah 56, verse 9 through 12. This is what God said through the prophet Isaiah about bad shepherds. Listen to this. All you animals of the field and forest, come and eat. Israel's watchmen are blind. Interesting take. They're blind, all of them, he says. They know nothing. All of them are mute dogs. They cannot bark. It's funny. They dream, lie down, and love to sleep. These dogs have fierce appetites. They never have enough. Now, let me stop here and step over here. I want to make a political comment. Then I'll come back over here. It's interesting to me that Politicians will spend $20 million to get a job that pays $100,000 a year. Just think about it. Is that new? No. The book of Isaiah says these dogs have fierce appetites. They never have enough. It's interesting to me that you can turn on the television and see a um, and most preachers are good people, but you see somebody that has a mansion that I couldn't afford the utilities on. And they have, I'm going to tell you something, a pastor doesn't need a different car for every day of the week. Can I get a witness on that? A past, an evangelist doesn't need a new plane because he's bored with his old one. Can I get an amen on that? I have a Buick. If it stops, I call Tracy and say, uh, you got to come get me. I don't have a car for every day of the week. But people that abuse the people they're chosen, they're supposed to lead these people. They abuse these people. Look what, what God's Word says. These dogs have fierce appetites. They never have enough. And they are shepherds who have no discernment. All of them turn to their own way, every last one for his own profit. Come, let me get some wine. Let's guzzle some beer, and tomorrow will be like today, only far better it's interesting listen to jeremiah chapter 23 woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture this is the lord's declaration therefore this is what the lord the god of israel says about the shepherds who tend my people you have scattered my flock banished them and have not attended to them isn't this I am about to attend to you. Did your parents ever, if you're, if you're a little bit older school, did your parents ever say that to you? We're going to when your daddy gets home, he's going to attend to this. I knew what that meant. I didn't want to hear that. But listen to this. Listen, I mean, let's just listen to the two sentences there. You have scattered my flock, banished them, and have not attended to them. I'm about to attend to you. Because of your evil acts, this is the Lord's declaration. Listen to this in Hebrews. Hebrews 13, verse 7. Remember your leaders who have spoken God's word to you. That's me. That's that's Derek. That's everybody that does what we do. As you carefully observe the outcome of their lives, imitate their faith. So I should have a lifestyle that is worth following. That makes any sense. Now, in verse 17 of the same chapter... Hebrews 13, 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them since they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account so that they can do this with joy and not with grief for that would be unprofitable for you. All right, so let's break this down. Obey your leaders and submit to them since they, that's me, Keep watch over your souls as those, that's me, who must give an account so that they, that's me, can do this with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. So let's break this down. I stand before the Lord, my life is over, and the Lord says, okay, John, I'm I'm opening up the records here, and let's look at your tenure at Gwinnett Community Church. Okay, started 2009, and you were there until you died. 
So, let's talk about your sermons. Let's talk about your Bible studies. Let's talk about your leadership. I want to be able to watch what he says. I want to be able to give an account for you with joy and not with grief. For that would be unprofitable for you. What you want is for me to stand before the Lord one day and say, I told them your word and they did it. And we're all happy. Yay team. What you don't want is for me to stand up in heaven and go, I told them. I did my job. Okay, you did, John. I got a record right here. You did your job. Okay, move over. Okay, when that community church step forward. He told you and told you and told you. And you didn't do it and didn't do it and didn't do it. It is a, it is a great and heavy responsibility to be a leader, especially a pastor, because I am responsible for your souls. Like, I want you to be everything God wired you to be. And I want to stand before him one day with joy and say, Lord, I told them what you told me to tell them. And I did the best I could do. And they did what your word said they should do. This is a big theme in the Bible. I mean, this is a big theme with God. Let me get back to where I was. There we go. The word shepherd here, the word, the word shepherd, you see it the first time in verse 2. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The word shepherd, if you break it down in the Greek, it, means, it really means to protect and to provide. To protect and to provide. So that takes us to the second part of this passage, verse 7 through 10. We are to protect, shepherds protect and provide. Jesus said to them, verse 7, Truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. I am the gate, right there, for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep didn't listen to them. I am the gate. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. Now, I've heard people say that means salvation. It doesn't mean salvation. It does, and, and look at this verse. Uh, I am the gate. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and come in and out and find pasture. This is not salvation. Jesus would not lead us to leave the fold. What this is teaching here is that there is liberty in intimacy with the shepherd. That, that as sheep, we are to get as close as we can to the shepherd. And the closer you are, the safer you feel. I, I want to recommend a book to you. It's one of my favorite all-time books. I've read it several times. I've taken guys through it on Bible studies. It's called A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23 by Philip Keller. He was a shepherd. He grew up on a sheep ranch. He raised sheep, and then he became a minister. And he, Psalm 23 is about an entire lo- year in the life of a sheep, a herd of sheep. It's fascinating. You need to get that book. It's really good. Um... But he takes him, like when you, when you, okay, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Sheep cannot lie down unless all distractions have been taken care of. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Restores in Psalm 23, and you see in other places, cast down, cast down a, a sheep can get upside down, and they're not bright, and they don't know how to get back up. They can actually die on their backs. Their stomachs, their their intestines will kill them if somebody doesn't restore them. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for. Now, I want you to to notice something about Psalm 23. Five times it's he, then five times it's you. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not. Watch my hands. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. 
I missed one. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For, watch this, thou art with me. Thy rod, thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, and my cup runneth over. What's the difference? What's the difference between he and you, death? Watch this. Yea, though I walk, he leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Now watch the change. For you're with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. When, when, when this talks about coming in and out, it is maintaining that closeness. When the shepherd goes out of the sheepfold, the sheep go with him. When he goes back in the sheepfold, the sheep go with him. They don't wander away from him. If they wander away from him, there are consequences. If a sheep, a particular sheep, is a wanderer, like if a particular sheep's little theme song was, I'm a wanderer, oh, a wanderer. Okay, well, you can be a wanderer if you want to. But let me tell you, and then you might think this is cruel, but let me tell you what the shepherd would do. He would catch that wandering sheep that keeps wandering off, and he would break one of his legs. Then he would set the leg, and then he would take the sheep, and he would put him up on his shoulders, and he would, so his legs would hang over, and the, and the sheep's body would go around his neck kind of like a muffler, and he would hold his legs. And while the days turned into weeks of healing that leg, he was close to the shepherd. The shepherd would talk to him. The shepherd would, and you know, I don't know if the sheep understood English language, but he would say stuff like, you don't need to be wandering, around, wandering off. If I hadn't found you, a wolf would have found you, bit your head off. Would you rather be missing a head or have a little game leg? Those kind of things. And hopefully, most of the time, when he healed, he, he put him down and he didn't wander off anymore. The closer... You are to the shepherd, the safer you feel. You can come in and out and find pasture. There is liberty and freedom in intimacy with Christ. The closer to Christ you feel, the less... All right, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in His wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. The closer we get to Him the less the world... Can you imagine if you're as skittish as sheep were to be away from the shepherd, how scary that was. Like they're looking around. There's all kinds of predators. There are all kinds of noises. Every time a stick would break in, the, in, in a bush, was that a wolf? Was that... What was that? Was that a snake? The closer we stay... So, so Jesus was saying... That not only, let me go back one, not only do I know my sheep, consequently you don't know the sheep, but I protect and provide for them. Now, let's go to the next one. Jesus sacrifices for his sheep. In verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The word good here means beautiful. It means noble, it means genuine. Beautiful, noble, genuine. So put that together, good, shepherd. Good, beautiful, noble, genuine. Shepherd, one who provides and protects. Jesus said, I am the good, noble, genuine provider and protector of the sheep. Guys, he says to them, what are you? You're thieves. You're robbers. You steal. You kill. You destroy. You get fat off the sacrifice of other people. You don't even care about those people. You don't care about this young man that's been healed and now he can see. You don't care about him. All you care about is you. Wow. Look at verse 11. I am the good shepherd. I lay down, a good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Verse 14, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. There it is again. Now look at verse 
18, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down on my own. I have the right to lay it down, and I have the right to take it up again. Now, we know that in the immediate context, Jesus was talking about a shepherd that lays down his life and becomes the door, right? He lays down his life and has become the door for the sheep. He's a good shepherd. He's beautiful, noble, genuine provider and protector. He lays down his life. But there's a far greater meaning for laying down your life. Where did Jesus lay down his life? On the cross. Now, it, happened, it hadn't happened yet. Maybe the disciples don't even know what he's talking about yet. But he knew what he was talking about. I'm going to lay my life down ultimately. I'm going to lay down voluntarily on a piece of wood. I'm going to let them drive spikes through my wrists right here and right here. I'm going to let them drive spike through my feet. I'm going to let them jab a spear in my side. I'm going to let them beat me till I don't even look like a human being. Until my own friends wouldn't recognize me. I am willing to lay down my life for my sheep. Something I like in verse 16 that I, I want to bring to your attention. Verse 16, but I have other sheep that are not from this sheep pen. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. Then there will be one flock, one shepherd. What does that mean? There are Jews. Now remember, Jesus came, okay, John 1, 11. He came into his own, his own received him not, verse 12. But to as, to as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. He came to his own. Who were his own? Jewish people. They rejected him. He went to the Gentiles. Romans 1.16, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Everybody in the world at that time was either Jewish or not Jewish. If you were not Jewish, you were called Greek or barbarian or pagan and what jesus was saying is i'm bringing people into my fold that are not of the original flock but they're going to be of the they're going to be of the new flock there's going to be jews they're going to be gentiles i don't know about you i'm a gentile i was just born that way you know some people are born handsome some people are born with hair some people wish they had it some people are tall some people are short um I, Tracy and I have done these studies where you can send off your blood samples and stuff and they can tell you you're 20% Scottish and whatever. You know, just like, here's what I know. I'm not Jewish. But in my last, my, my, not the one I'm using now, but the one I used for about 15 years, my devotional Bible, everywhere in the New Testament it says Gentile. I highlighted Gentile and I wrote in big bold letters in the margin, me. That promise is for me. That promise is for most of us who are not Gentiles. He expanded the gospel to not just include Jewish people, but included all people. Aren't you glad? All you that aren't Jews, aren't you glad that he extended that gospel to you and me? Okay, now listen to what Paul said in Ephesians. Let me read you this. This is in Ephesians chapter, hang on a second. Chapter 2, verse 11 to 22, he's talking about how uh, we are all being united into one body of Christ. And here's what he says in verse 15 of, of Ephesians 2. He made, he, Jesus, made of no effect the law consisting of commands and expressions, expressed in regulations so that he might create in himself one new man from the two, resulting in peace. Okay, let me read, let me read both of them back to back. Verse 16 of John 10, But I have other sheep that are not from this sheep pen. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. Then there will be one flock, one shepherd. Immediately to Ephesians. So that he might create in himself one new man from the two resulting in peace. So that's all that means. Is he was saying, I have some other sheep that are going to be a part of this family. And we know from Revelation that that family, this is so cool, that family will be comprised of every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Anybody that wants to accept Jesus, it doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter what your DNA is. We are all saved by grace through faith. And that not of ourselves is a gift of God. 
So I love that. Now let me just kind of start wrapping all this up. Jesus is the good shepherd who died for us. We, we learned that here this morning. But did you also know that Jesus is the great shepherd who rose for us? What does the Bible say in Hebrews 13, 20 and 21? Now may the God of peace who brought up from the dead the Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep. In John 10, he's called the good shepherd. In Hebrews 13, he's called the great shepherd of the sheep. Jesus is the great shepherd who rose for us. Jesus is the good shepherd who died for us, the great shepherd who rose for us, and the chief shepherd who's coming back for us. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. This week we went to uh, the beach. We had a great time. It was fun. And... uh, Trace and I went down a couple of days early, and it was nice and peaceful and calm. And then on uh, Saturday, uh, our son, daughter-in-law, and granddaughters came, and it was fun. It really was. But I'm, I, I realized this week, I didn't, I didn't realize this until this week, I've never spent eight straight days all day with grandchildren. And I love them, and they were fine. They were perfect. There's no problem. It's just when you're with them a lot, you're reminded of stuff. Usually we're with them three, four hours at a time. We'll go to one of their soccer games or ball games, and then, or we'll go out to eat, or they'll come to the house, or we'll go to their house, or whatever, but not like several days in a row. Uh, my 10-year-old granddaughter is becoming a little lady. She's about this much shorter than Tracy, but should catch Tracy in about a week and a half. Like, she's growing, and, like, I don't know if Tracy's getting shorter or she's getting taller or what, but they're going to be doing this one of these days. So, and she's just, I'm so proud of her. She's a great kid. The other one is great. She's four. Amelia's a trip. Zachary, I, I, I swam more this week than I have in the last five years because I wanted to make memories with my granddaughters. I wanted them to remember Pop Pop is fun. So I'm, I'm in the water, and Zach and, Ke- Zach and I and Abigail, Amelia were out in the, water in the beach and she had on the water wings and the donut thing and she's floating and Zachary's pulling around with the donut and she pushes him away because she wants to do it by herself and he pretends to be hurt oh you pushed me away you know kind of thing stuff you do with a four-year-old I was there I saw it I heard it she takes her little hand she goes I still like you Like, okay, well, that was interesting. And so she's floating around, and I went over to Zach. I said, did, did I hear what I just heard? She said she still likes She goes, yeah. It's, you know, it was like he's used to it. Like. But all through the week, she would do stuff like, pop, pop, play with me. Pop, pop, sit next to me. Pop, pop, I drew you a picture. Things like that. But if she was upset about something, And I said, well, come here, come to Pop Pop, let me see. She looked through me like I wasn't even there. And I I was reminded this week that there are four levels with her. Like, if everything's okay, she'll come to me. If things are mostly okay, she'll go to Tracy, but not me. If things are kind of tough but tolerable, she'll go to Zachary. But if things are really bad, there's only one place she's going. Can you tell me where that's at? That's right. And if she was hurt physically or emotionally, like if Abigail hurt her feelings or something, and she had a meltdown. She didn't want me. She didn't want Tracy. She didn't want Zach. She wanted her mom. That was her go-to when she was stressed, upset, hurt, scared, angry. Where do you go when you're stressed? scared, hurt, upset, and angry. Because I'm going to tell you something. I've learned. Wherever you go, wherever you run to, that is your shepherd. You can say anything you want to say. Well, the Lord is my shepherd. But if you run to something else other than Him, He's not your shepherd. Where do you run to when your life has fallen apart? Some people crawl inside a bottle and drink the neck and shoulders off of it. Some people just bury themselves in work. 
Trace and I have a friend that we worked with over at Grace, and she's a wonderful woman. She had a teenage son, died of cancer at age 16. She just crawled into work, and she worked like a dog every day until she dropped at night. And I remember talking to her saying, Denise, this is, you're killing yourself here. She said, I, if I work, she said to me, if I work hard enough and push myself long enough and hard enough every day until I fall in the bed, I don't have to think about Jesse. Some people pour themselves into work. I'm just going to work. I'm, I'm going to work. I'm going to pour myself into my job, and that way I don't have to think about it. Some people find vices. I'm going to do that. That'll help me get me through. I want to feel something, or I want to feel nothing. Whatever you go to, that's your shepherd. Now, here's what I know. The good shepherd, the great shepherd, the chief shepherd. He's my shepherd. He's yours. I know he provides. Let me ask you. Oh, right, let, me, let me just reverse this. Has Jesus proven to you that he has laid down his life for you? Has he done that? Yes? Okay. Has he proven time and time again that he has provided for you? Has he proven time and time again he's protected you? Even sometimes from yourself? Yeah. Does he know you? Question. How well do you know him? Is he your knee-jerk reaction when life is falling apart? Do you go find the shepherd? Because I'm going to tell you, jobs, sports. I mean, those are not bad things, but jobs, sports, work, addictions make for lousy shepherds. I know. I've been so close to God that I could almost feel Him breathing on my neck. And I've been so far away from Him that I didn't know if He was there or not. I remember when we lost our first son, he lived about four hours. And after that, I was, I was in the... I was in, seminary I was studying for the ministry and I was doing some homework and Tracy came by the room where I was in our apartment and she said what are you doing I said you want to know the truth she said yeah I said I'm studying to learn how to preach about a guy that I'm not sure is even there have you ever felt like God's a million miles away from you have you ever felt that way some of y'all be honest enough to slip your hand up. Yeah, there have been times where I felt like, God, where are you? My, my prayers are bouncing off the roof. I open the Bible, it's dry as a stick. I don't know what's going on. And there have been other times where it feels like God is just breathing on my neck. Here's what you do. You get up next to the shepherd as close as you can, and you stay as long as you can. And the closer you are, the less there is to fear. How well do you know him? It's fascinating to me that Paul the Apostle, after he wrote, he wrote Philippians, he'd been saved for 25 years. He'd been saved. And you know what he said? Chapter 3, verse 10, that I may know him. I want to know him. Wow, Paul, 25 years? You don't know him? Oh yeah, but there's just so much to know. I want to know him. I want to know the power of his resurrection. I want to know the fellowship of his sufferings. Being made conformable to his death. Jesus said, I am. I am. Ego, I me. The good shepherd. Who gives his life for his sheep. Father, thank you for being our shepherd. Thank you for being the door. Thank you that you protect us from predators. You keep us close to you. You don't let predators, you don't let things get to us that you don't allow to get to us. And we don't even know, God, how many things you've protected us from. Things that could have happened that you stopped your angels. You didn't let them happen. 
And when we get to heaven, we're going to be surprised at the number of times you saved our bacon. And we didn't even know it. You know us. You protect us. You provide for us. You lay down your life for us on Calvary. He gave His life. What more could He give? Oh, how He loves you and me. Lord, help us to find respite, rest, solstice in the, in the presence, the daily presence of the shepherd, the good shepherd. Thank you for being our shepherd. Thank you for being good. Thank you for caring about us. We love you and we're grateful. In Jesus' name, amen. If the Lord has spoken to your heart this morning and you don't know the Lord, I'd love to talk to you about that. And if you just are going through a tough time and you want somebody to pray with you, I'd be glad to pray with you. Uh, we're we're, we're going to hang out until you, want, until you leave. But if uh, you need somebody to talk to, we're here. Thanks for coming this morning. We're going to finish this next week. We're going to finish John chapter 10 next week. We're going to look at the verses 27 to 30. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and, I, and they will never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my Father's hand. My Father who gave them me is greater than all. No man will pluck them out of my Father's hand. I am my Father to one. So we're going to look at that next week. Thanks for coming. Hope you have a great week. God bless. We'll see you later.